The nurse checked on me one last time, finished some paperwork, and briefed the young woman on the incoming shift. I'll probably see you tomorrow then, so take care, she said as she got ready to leave. Oh, do you work in the morning, I asked. I clutched the bed rails as another contraction gripped my belly with surprising strength. Things had been slow until then. No, I only work the evening shift, she said. I breathed through the contraction. The vice-like pain started to subside. But surely I won't still be here tomorrow night, will I? I asked once I caught my breath. She will have been born by then, don't you think? Every labor is different especially this one. You know that. She was right. I was well aware of that fact. This wasn't my first baby. It was my tenth. But even still, it wasn't what I expected or what I wanted to hear. Another contraction came on and I gripped the bed rails. Breathe in, breathe out, out, out. I moaned as the pain moved across the front of my body. I was holding out on the epidural as long as possible because I didn't want to risk a C-section. I needed to do this for myself and for her, or I would forever regret it. Another contraction came on, and I gripped my husband Doug's hand. I needed to squeeze something warm, soft, and forgiving, not something as hard as the bed rails. The baby's parents stayed in the shadows of the room. He, wincing as I moaned, panted and writhed, she wringing her hands, eyes welling up with tears, choking them back for my benefit. She would have traded places with me in a heartbeat, I knew. But she could not safely carry for herself. And so here we were, this dark, cold evening, waiting out the hours that preceded the birth. The next contraction squeezed me so tightly, I told Doug to get the anesthesiologist. I couldn't take the pain anymore the one in my belly, and the one in my heart. At least the doctor could relieve me from the pain of the contractions. A young nurse stayed by me and comforted me. The parents watched and grimaced along with me. It's painful to go through childbirth yourself, but to have to watch a woman screaming in agony with your unborn child creating that pain, it feels all your fault. Even though there is no fault, we were all willing participants. I got the epidural, but the contraction still increased in intensity. The doctor upped the dose, then left the room to give us some peace. A monster contraction came on, and I recoiled from the stabbing pain. For the first time in all my previous labors, I broke down into tears. I can't do this. I can't do this, I sobbed. Tears were streaming down my face. While I prefer not to be touched during my labors, Doug still took my hand and held it tight. I was so wrapped up in my head and my heart that I didn't hesitate to accept his comforting gesture. The baby's mother moved closer to the bed, whispering, you're doing great. You can do this. You can get through this. I knew she would choose to be in my place, grave pain and all, if she could. This was never her choice. I yelled out. I twisted onto my left side. Doug's hand was on the bed rail as I pressed my forehead hard into it. She's coming, I whispered to Doug between sobs. I know, he whispered back. I'm pushing, I whispered. I know, he whispered back. Another contraction took over my body and I lifted my hips and pushed with all the force I could. The nurse came back into the room saw me, and ran for the doctor. The epidural hadn't taken effect, so I could support all my weight with my legs as I bore down through my middle, still pressing into my husband's hand on the rail. One strong push, and I felt her tiny, warm, wet body slide out onto the bed. She was still encased in her amniotic sac. It had gone so quickly that her membranes had never ruptured. I sat up and cradled her between my legs. She lay on the bed, lifeless, still, exactly as she had been inside my body. She had passed away at 24 weeks, 
a fully formed doll-sized version of a newborn. We spent the next four hours soaking her in, touching every inch of her skin, her fingers, her toes, her belly, her lips. When I held her, I felt her slight weight in my arms, the contour of her back and neck and head, trying to absorb every sensation for the first and last time. When her parents held her, I sat with my eyes closed, still feeling her on the inside, even though she had crossed over. She had crossed over from me to them and from life to death. We held her and kissed her and dressed her and baptized her and took pictures, so many pictures. And we gave her over for cremation. We took our time saying goodbye. We let ourselves cry rivers of tears after being so strong the last few weeks when we had known she'd be leaving us too soon. She was born at 10 p.m. and we left the hospital at 3 a.m. The stark light of the hallway shone brightly on the green sign posted on our door. The image of water droplets of a falling leaf. They had placed it there when I had arrived. They told me it's the universal symbol for grief. Doug and I got home from the hospital close to 5 a.m. and crawled into bed. We were shell-shocked, yet awash with relief that it was over. We'd been gone from home for less than 24 hours. Laying in bed, I apologized to him for crushing his hand against the bed rails. He laughed and said, it was fine. It was painful, but nothing compared to the pain I was going through, he said. It was the least he could do, he said. And then he said, Besides, I knew you were about to deliver the baby, so it would be over quickly. You knew she was coming out, I asked incredulously. Yes, I told you that while you were pushing, he said. Yeah, I know you said that, but if you really knew, why didn't you tell the nurse? Because I knew you wanted to do it by yourself, he said. And I knew you could. A silent tear rolled down my cheek into the pillow in the 5 a.m. darkness. He held so much faith in my body, in my deepest longing for the birth I'd wanted and the birth I needed, knowing it was all I had to hold on to this time. <laughs>